I'm Claudine Wong, joining you from the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm joined by Arun Panasami, who is with CollegeWise, considered one of the largest college admissions co counseling organizations in the country. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me, Claudine. Okay, so much to talk about. Oh my goodness, you know, there is so much uncertainty, you know, as we grieve the high school seniors who are losing their graduations and their senior proms and all of those things. You know, I think a lot of parents I've talked to are now a little bit past that. They have moved on now to what happens in the fall with college. And then the parents of college or high school juniors are saying, uh, what's going on now? I mean, there's a lot of anxiety, not for this exact moment we're in, but the ones that are to come. I mean, how busy are you guys talking to your clients and your family saying, take a breath, we're trying to figure it out, we're trying to figure it out. Right. Well, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of anxious and students, a lot of anxious students and parents out there who are reaching out to us, um, both new ones and ones that we've worked with for years. Um, thankfully, we have been thinking about this probably going back at least six weeks and been trying to be the calm in the center of the storm. And I, I certainly understand where a lot of that anxiety comes from. But, you know, as we gather information and we take a look at some of the trends and we talk to folks, in these admissions offices in these universities, I think there actually is some room for optimism. Um, but at the same time, as you know, we all know, things are changing so rapidly every day that oh, what gosh. is true today might not be tomorrow. Right. I, uh, that's my standard line. I'm like, the good idea on Monday sounds absolutely ridiculous by Wednesday. And I don't think that has changed over the weeks. Now, I looked up your bio, your background, and I know that you were doing admissions for several cycles uh, at UCLA, University of Chicago, Caltech, you've, you've been through this process before and, and never something like this. I mean, the colleges, it seems to me, are kind of trying to stick to the, the ways that they've always done things, right? They sent out their congratulations. Maybe they didn't, they obviously are not having tours, which is this month, people, you know, high school seniors should right. be flooding the colleges trying to figure out which is the right fit and they can't do that so everyone's doing it virtually how does this change when you're looking at the because there's so much guessing right in terms of yields and who right. accepts and your wait list how much conversation do you think is happening at these colleges right now saying well what does this mean for international students when are they going to say if they're going to come and what does this mean for in-state out-of-state who thinks they can you know, how is this going to change all the yields? Right. Well, you know, as we speak to admissions officers, these are conversations that are taking place every day and pretty much all day long. Um, they have, you know, internally, they have people who are focused on all this number crunching. Many of them work with enrollment management specialists who can help them, you know, create the algorithms, the models to kind of determine how many students do we need from, you know, this particular demographic to get this particular revenue. Those models have been kind of turned upside down, shaken mm -hmm. around, yeah. broken in half, whatever the case might be. Um, they're, I, I don't want to say they're flying blind because they do have a lot of data to work with, but this is, you know, to use the word for the umpteenth time, this is unprecedented. And, you know, a, a lot of them to a certain extent have to cross their fingers, hope for the best. Um, I do yeah. agree with you. Admissions offices tend to, you know, um, be pretty risk averse to just do things the way that they've always done yeah. them. We've seen a little bit of flexibility from some subsets of schools, you know, that traditional May 1st deadline where you have to put your deposit down as a senior saying, this is where I'm going. Uh, we've got about 350 schools that have now shifted to June first. Unfortunately, it isn't a lot of the highly selective or, you know, right. So the big schools. ones are still May 1st, Resisting. which will be an interesting date to see how May 1st looks i mean let's say you have a kid on the wait list at one of those big schools are you telling those families you might have a better chance because usually that yield is it's got a pretty specific number of yep who gets in off the wait list are you telling those kids man the wait list could be a a actually a good place to opt into these days you know, it's a great question, Claudine. I mean, I think it depends on individual schools. I mean, if we talk about schools like Berkeley, UCLA, these are schools that have always been popular, have always yielded at a high rate. And then when we look at, you know, additional, you know, streams of data, we're seeing a lot of students who are saying, I think I might want to stay closer to home. And so that kid who, you know, 
had maybe been thinking about heading to the East Coast, you know, from California is now, I might stay at my local public or so they might you, choose a UCLA when the, instead of choosing Michigan and then that's, because they wanted to go. And correct. And then that it. swallows up some of the previous, the spots that might have opened up on the wait list. Um, you know, I think the most highly selective of schools, they're going to end up yielding at a fairly similar rate. These schools are, are rich financial aid. They're, they're able to offer in such large quantities that it often doesn't affect, you know, students' decision-making. They'll probably stay the same, but there'll be a pretty quick trickle-down effect. And like you said, May, May 1st, we're gonna learn a lot more, but the reality is, is now that there's a significant number of schools that are shifted to June 1st, we're gonna see a lot of different behavior. Like I expect students are gonna be getting taken off the wait list in the middle of August, even late August for September, you know, starts. It makes it very, if, if, if there are September starts, right. In Boston, they're deciding to maybe the backup plan is starting in January. How likely is that? Well, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't want to <laughs> yeah. like speak no, on I'm behalf of. I'm going to hold you of... to it, Aaron. I'm like, that, that's it. You said, yeah. But I mean, every school that is responsible and, you know, fiscally responsible, you know, ethically responsible, they are creating these backup, you know, pl- I don't know if it's plan B or if it's plan C at this point of yeah, what happens plan, if we need yeah. to start fall semester online? What, what do we just take fall off and shift to starting in January? I think these are things, you know, I have a number of friends who are faculty at different universities. Mm-hmm. These are very real conversations, you know, and how taking place. Tuition? Right? How do you charge well, tuition for someone who is getting an online education? Yep. Uh, because college is expensive, and you are yep. paying for them to go to that campus, live in those dorms, uh, hang out there. You know, for, and that goes not just for the freshmen, obviously, but the sophomore, juniors, you know, seniors right. of saying uh, we were paying for one thing. We're not going to give you all that money for a shortened down version of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got to think, you know, colleges, you know, having been a former admissions officer, we didn't sell students on just what took place in the classroom. We right. sold them on that full experience. And now you're saying, oh, taking a class on my laptop in my parents' basement is the same thing, and you're going to charge me the same. These colleges have to weigh all these things. You know, there's been a lot of talk about students, you know, asking for refunds, but the yes. reality is, is many of these colleges are tuition driven. You know, every dollar going in is being used to pay to keep the lights on, to like make sure students are fed, to keep the dorms clean. Um, there's a lot of fixed costs in place at these universities. And, you know, some of these schools have, you know, endowments the size of entire countries, you know, when we right. talk about the Harvards and Stanfords, but most universities don't. And so, any sort of hit, you know, and even endowments have taken a massive hit. And we look in the state of California, I would not be surprised to see our own legislature, you know, having to reduce even further the amount of money they put into higher education, which, which that'll change things too. But I, but they certainly, I haven't heard any school saying, Hey, by the way, if you accept, this is our plan to charge you less, or this is our discounted plan. Or, you know, I know a lot of people in the spring parents were saying, yeah, that tuition was still the same, even though my kid's at home now. Like, nothing actually changed. I paid, paid my final payment, and, and yeah. th- there was no move there. But I th- think certainly in the fall, if you're going to ask people to. Yeah, well, you know, and. The, right, the dorms are available. I heard UCLA's dorms are being used in part to house doctors. Yep, Or the UCLA yep. Medical Center. You know, if those dorms are still being used for that purpose come fall, we hope not. But because we hope the need won't be there. But if it is, you can't put kids in there anyway. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's part of the reason that, you know, I've been encouraging students, parents, you know, friends who are counselors, like, let's focus on what we can control. And, you know, encouraging students to keep their focus on their own kind of intellectual growth, their own personal growth, social emotional growth. You you can go absolutely mad if you try to keep track of every school shifting to test optional every school kind of with rumors of, hey, they might open online or they might only open in January. We, everything is changing right now. And the hope is, you know, with a few weeks, with a few months, we'll get a little bit more stability. Um, I'm strongly encouraged, as are all my colleagues at CollegeWise, strongly encouraging students, parents, see this, you know, once you got your basic needs, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you've got your food, you've got your shelter, you've got probably broadband internet is on there now. (laughs) Once you've got that kind of settled down, look at this as an opportunity as opposed to an obstacle. You know, this is, you know, for these younger students, you know, many of them get drawn to a college because it's a pretty campus or it's famous. 
well, this is a time where you can really dig in deep and research, like, what, what do I even want college for? If, I'm, if I have to take it online, what would be the purpose of this education? Like, and start developing some sense of who they want to be and whatever. I don't know if we're ever going to go back to a normal world. So no. what do they want to look like? I would love uh, it if we did, but, uh, you know, I just, it becomes harder and harder to imagine in, in, in this space and in this world. Yeah, you know, we we're not going to be ever shaking hands again, right? I feel I like. I know. I'm like, when am I going to see someone in the store and hug them and not be freaked out? I, I don't, I don't know when that's coming. I do miss it. You know, I do miss that. I feel the same way. That option. You know, we talk about a lot of surveys that are going forward, and you guys have talked about this survey from Samson and Scarborough. I want to pull it up so people can see it. And let's just kind of talk about some of the things that they found, and then you can tell me how, you know, how accurate or from what sure. you're seeing they are. So one in four decided high school seniors say their college choice has been affected by COVID-19. That's right. a lot. And, and affected, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that that could play out, right? Absolutely. I mean, for some students, this is, you know, a reference to, I think I want to say closer to home, right? I've heard stories of kids getting stranded on the other side of the country and being left to their own devices. Right. I think I'd rather be within two to three hours, have my car, right? Mm -hmm. For other students, it's my family's finances have collapsed. And the school that I thought that I, you know, had money and could afford based on the financial aid package is no longer viable. And now I need to consider some of the options, right? And right. there will be some families who are like taking a look at, you know, all these possible changes in the fall and saying, this might be the year, I, you know, my counselor would encourage me to take a gap year, maybe wind down a little bit, find a little bit more purpose or vision for myself. Is, is the defer. gap year, yeah, is the gap year and deferring, how does that work in terms of how would that affect, you got a lot of high school juniors who are saying, don't take my spot next year. Well, and that's a concern, right? Is, you know, does that mean that if more students opt to kind of wait till next year, there are a few students? Reality is, is I think colleges are going to do their best to fill in as many, you know, beds or mm -hmm. seats in the classroom as possible, because that's tuition revenue they need coming in. And I think next year, what we'll see is either the possibility of, depending on the nature of those schools, some schools will, yeah, they're going to be more selective. They only have a finite amount of space. Let's assume by next fall, things are back in a place where colleges want to have full residence right. halls and yeah. full classrooms. Well, that space is finite. You may have some schools that can kind of quickly build some, you know, temporary residences, which sometimes happens when schools over yield. You've heard the stories of like, yeah. you know, trailers filling the quads. You may see, see some schools go that route to get that additional tuition revenue. Cause again, the fixed costs at these universities, this research is not free. The faculty aren't free. These gymnasiums and, you know, residence halls, they all come with enormous costs. Um, colleges are going to be pretty creative in trying to in ensure that they've got bodies and bodies that are bringing uh, revenue with them. Yeah, but because I can see some high school seniors saying, I want the full experience that I signed up for, which that first year in the dorms, a lot of kids don't live in the dorms after that first year. That's the that's the yep. time they make friends. That's the that's when they set the tone. And if they can't have it because of yeah. COVID-19, maybe they want to wait and make sure they have it the next year or at least have a better opportunity to have it. And, and you know, do they have that option to say, I want to accept, but I'm going to accept for 2021? Right. Well, and, and that's where there is some, you know, talk of like radically revising even the way colleges and universities work. You know, in the rest of the world, college is a three-year experience. Imagine shaving off a quarter of expenses mm -hmm. by cutting it to three years, you know, but at the same time, there are oldsters like me who fondly, I'm still friends with people I met during oh, orientation week, right? I had a lot of fun at UCLA, yes. Yeah. I oh, you're a UCLA grad. I am, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, so. I, and I enjoyed it every single year. You don't tell people that in the Bay Area though, right? <laughs> oh, I do. Proudly, proudly I do. Um, okay, <laughs> so let's go to this. Decided high school seniors and the impact of COVID-19 on their college choice. How likely are you to change your mind about the college you want to attend as a result of COVID-19? 44% highly unlikely. This is what you're saying with some people who, you know, the highly likelies are only 4%, you mm -hmm. know, and is that, would you say, the the economics and the staying home. Those are the, those are the folks who are saying, 
Maybe. Right. I mean, and I, you know, I, I also think some of this, you know, I, we can't disaggregate this data, but if we did, I have a strong suspicion that, you know, there are kids who have grown up with the idea of college in their heads since day one. It's just part yeah. of the family conversation. There are for other kids, first generation students, rural kids in, you know, urban areas who may, they may be the first person in their family to go to college. And all of a sudden, this thing that they had dreamed of feels a lot more precarious when you see your parents out of work or struggling to pay the bills and you feel like, uh, maybe I should take the year off and help support the family. I suspect that those are a lot of the students who are like, oh, maybe college isn't the right thing um, right. for me. And I mean, it's tough to talk about, but the reality is, is there are a lot of advantages in this admissions process for families who have means, who have wealth, right? I mean, you can hire yeah. tutors, you can hire a college counselor like me, um, but it's also that safety net where, you know, a lower income family might be like, Ugh, we, we need yeah. those resources diverted in a different way. It's certainly not fair and it's certainly not the same for every single family and depending on the industry in which their their income comes from, too, that some are right. harder than others as well. Yep. Now, this is this is for the undecided, you know, and these are the people who are still sitting there. They've got a couple of weeks before that May 1st deadline or six weeks if they have a June 1st deadline. But, you know they may, if they weren't 100% sure on this was my dream school, this is, I think, where some of the movement could be as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of students, you know, with visits having been taken away, colleges have been really responsive um, to providing these virtual opportunities, open houses, creating ways to connect professors with students, with current students. And, you know, at the same time, is that the same as physically being on a campus yeah. and kind of going with your gut instinct? No. And I think, you know, for some kids, they're having to make decisions in a way that they didn't imagine they'd have to. I mean. Right. I mean, that's a, it's a, and, and not that they imagine they, you know, I think I know a lot of parents who were planning on visiting a school if it was, mm -hmm. you know, on the, on the bubble of where they thought they might want to, might be able to get into planning right. on visiting that that right now because they yep. said well, let's not go there and get your hopes up for the school that might be a reach school for you right and now they got in and they're so excited but now they really haven't actually seen it and you know if it's out of state and it's expensive or it's you know i mean they're all expensive but if it's right. more you know on the bubble of what you wanted to pay well now how do you pay for something you've never seen well, and, and speaking to that, you know, I think most kids, you know, if, you, if you're in a fortunate enough situation where you created a smart balance list and you found yourself getting into five or six or more, more schools, you're not equally in love with all of them. You've got perhaps those two to three that are really drawing your interest and yeah. dig in there. These colleges, they are absolutely here to serve you now. Ask questions, ask them to connect you with the people that you want to speak to. The other thing I want to kind of point out is, you know, I, I understand this idea of dream colleges, but I can't tell you, having been doing this in some capacity for about 25 years, you're 16, you're 17, you're 18, you've got to school and it feels like the most important thing in the world. And then you don't get in and you go to another school. Time and time again, by yeah. Thanksgiving, those students call me, they text me, they email me like, Arun, you're totally right. I love where I'm at. I can't imagine that I'd be happier anywhere else, right? Yes. Yeah, well, and so end I, up where they're supposed to be, you know? And it absolutely, out. and absolutely. You, if, you, if you've picked, a, if those final two to three choices reasonably, they have the majors you're interested in, an environment that you'd feel like is a place that would make you happy, odds are, by far, you're gonna be perfectly fine there. It is not something to, you know, freak out about if it's important, but it probably isn't as important as you think of it. It's the difference between, I, I talk about it being the difference between being precise versus accurate, you know? Just be happy with hitting the target. Don't worry about hitting the bullseye because the bullseye is constantly moving. Just yeah. focus on hitting the target. And we all change in college, and so who we think we are when we're seniors in high school often- Million changes, times, you know, yeah. When you're, when you're freshman and sophomore year and you're like, oh wait, you know, you, you spread your wings and that's the whole point, I think. This is what you were growth. saying, this number of kind of what you're saying in terms of the stability of it, really, if 89% are still planning to enroll in this traditional yeah. four-year college, then it's not as, I mean, this is 8%. So, I mean, that can be a lot of, a lot of kids, you know, when you're talking about, I mean, this survey, I think when I look at it, it, it surveyed, you know, 530 or so kids. And yep. so it's not like it's, you know, hard. Every and kid. Fast and, and, you know, you can always pick apart polls, but 8%, I mean, a 10% yield of people who are saying, well, maybe I just won't go. Maybe I'll go to that 
junior college, get a couple of units, work, help my family. Yep. You know. Well, and that's probably where my greatest concern lies is that 8% students now gets added to the kids who were already planning on going to community college. And there's plenty of data during these kinds of economic disruptions that there is a surge in people who want to enroll in community college mm -hmm. or even four-year colleges because there aren't jobs. So this is a time to right. go to school. And well. yeah. will our community college system, and I, and I hope that the funding will be there because they're one of the most amazing resources we have in the state of California. I, my fear is it might get a little overwhelmed this fall as people try to save a few bucks and those systems get um, oh, yeah. flooded with the traditional that. students, but a lot of the non-traditional ones, folks who are like, ah, yeah, I think maybe it's time for me to go back to school and kind of up my educational game. Mm, that's interesting. And so, and this is, I think this is maybe one of our final ones, but you know, when you're talking about financial situation being affected, you know, you've got 53%. I mean, so many people are touched by this. How deep that, that impact is, 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 and those are, you know, that's not even including the students who have no clue what's going on with their parents' finances, right? right? Well, right, if you ask a kid, you know, they don't. So you know. I've got to imagine at this point, that number's got to have gotten bumped up to about 80 to 90%. Well, this 12% and 18%. If we put in the don't knows in, in <laughs> let's put it in the yes category, right. you know, I mean. Yep. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Pretty oh, yeah, factor. exactly. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone's yeah. affected in some way, shape, or form. Right. But I think, you know, this is also, this is what we were talking before about what the next year looks like, you know, how likely, yep. you know, I, it looks like, you know, between highly likely and likely, you've got people being fairly positive, 86% say, yeah, I think we're going to go back to school. Yep. Well, but so a lot of it, I think is what we want to happen. <laughs> yes. You know? And that 14%, if a school loses 14% of their students, and depending on which 14% that, yeah. that is, if that ends up being a lot of their full pay students who aren't on financial aid, that, has a, that could be 25 or 30% of their income, right? So yeah. even these small gaps of students who turn around and go, yeah, I don't think I'm heading back. This is part of the deep concern at a lot of universities, um, UCs included, where international students have been a huge source of revenue. I think most folks are aware of the fact that international students pay significantly more, out-of-state mm -hmm. students pay a lot more. If those students decide to stay home, you'll be able to fill in some of that with domestic, you know, California students, but probably not all of it, you know, yeah, and, and many I of these international students are not sure. And we also have the visa issue. We're not processing right. visas now. And the embassies, I don't even know if they can so. come, even if they're willing to come, and even if they're willing to pay, they may not be able to logistically make that make that happen. I mean, Chinese students have been a huge part of you know the American university system in the last decade, and college-wise, we work with a number of them. Speaking to some of those parents, they're like, "I have one child, and I'm not sure I feel comfortable." sending them, you know, we feel better with our systems in place or there are wonderful universities in Singapore and Hong Kong that seem to have a better handle on all of this. And so they're in a wait and see attitude themselves. And how which, long do they wait though, I guess is the question, like how long, and then the universities as well. I mean, I think traditionally I've read that if an international student turns down the offer, they try to give that an international student that yeah. that that seat right so you're filling with the same revenue seat that you thought you were again same with out of state now to state child doesn't want to come you offer it to a different out of state child instead of someone in state it would yep. seem to me now that that metric has to change a little bit that that international student you still can't fit more people in your dorms so right. you have to decide right. you can't give it to three in state students because the one out you know international student didn't come correct but you do have to figure out something if you really want to fill that seat with anyone who might likely be coming to your state. Well, and I think part of what we're seeing now is colleges kind of acknowledging the math that you just did right there. And that's why you're seeing even at a school like Harvard, they're laying off thousands of employees or furloughing them to save a few bucks, right? And that's a school with a massive endowment in place. And you'd kind of think, oh, but even those endowments aren't like, you know, it's not just something you can tap into and let the money pour out, they're tied up in other ways. And so this, like I said, this, this modeling, this, all these models have just been completely flipped upside down and shaken up and yeah. hard to know what all these colleges are going to do. And many of them, 
you know, are going to have to respond to like what their neighbors, you know, doing the, you know, one Ivy is watching another Ivy, yeah. you know, one public system is looking at another public system. Do you also think that, that parents and families are looking at the state's response? Like if you are a kid who wants to go to Tulane in New Orleans and you're hearing about the outbreak and you're hearing how far that they haven't seen the worst of it yet, that it's coming, you know, Michigan, for example, if you got into the University of Michigan, which is a great university and, you know. Well, you're talking to Ohio State fans, so I, I disagree, but, but go on. Go Buckeyes, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so there, there, I got it. So even it out, even it out, fair time. Um, but if you are looking at those schools and saying, or you, University of Florida, and you're like, I don't, I don't think I want to go to those states when you're talking about being nervous Right. Are California schools going to benefit or Washington schools being further down the timeline or having the perception that it's being handled better in one state versus another in terms of college admissions as well? Ab absolutely. I mean, I think people are, you know, and this is something we're encouraging all of our families to do all fam, you know, particularly this pressure is on the senior families. I, you know, I think for those juniors, those who are younger, a lot of this stuff is going to sort itself out. You have to becoming, wait. We can't you know, worry about you yet, yeah, right? Like, right. You're, yeah, but, you're not, right. But for the seniors, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a real conversation. Like, is Florida a viable option? Is Michigan um, a viable option compared to some states that have been more aggressive? Um, you know, as you noted, May 1st, we've got these couple weeks. Um, we've got perhaps till June 1st in some situation. Most colleges are being um, pretty accommodating. So even the schools that are at May 1st, um, uh, while I wish they would have shifted to June fun, uh, sorry, while I wish they would have shifted to June 1, in speaking with the, you know, the VPs of enrollment, they're saying if a student asks us for more time, we're likely to give it, give it to them. Um, I also think we're in an unusual situation, and this is somewhat controversial, there are going to be some families who, you know, traditionally there's, there's a, you put down a deposit and you're not, right. you just put down one deposit at one school. There are parents who openly discuss now we're double depositing, we're triple depositing for exactly the reasons. I want to see University of Miami is my child's top choice. We can afford it, but I'm not sending them to Florida right. unless I know that this is taken care of, you know, but I'm going to put a second deposit down at Oh, a UC, which will keep her closer to home. And so, so that's you know, you're saying the August decision may come late because they may, but you know, then you have housing issues and then you have all sorts of, I mean, is that the, the recommendation? Because the hope is that we would know something, you know, but in the long term of sticking a bunch of kids in a dorm, that just seems like a, like we can't go to the grocery store. So how are you going to put all yeah. these kids in a dorm setting, even if you start the school in the fall? Right. How do you well, actually, how, how does the university actually say, yeah, sure, we, we can do that. The soonest I've heard on the, the super duper fast track for a vaccine would be the fall. And, and that isn't even, you know, you know that's wildly optimistic, that. but yes, it's possible. It's wildly, but yeah, it, yeah I mean, um, I, I'm crossing fingers and toes and, and I, and I hope wildly optimistic turns into great, big, wonderful, you know, development, Right. But, you know, even, even if that's the case, the fall is, is a little I will later say, to move on down. I mean, I will say that universities, and, and this is speculation, this is moving definitely into that we're looking into the crystal ball. Mm -hmm. um, I like it. I, like <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I have heard some schools who are like, well, we have systems, you know, the, the contact tracing that's being used effectively in, um, throughout much of East Asia. Um, we're already keeping track of, you know, the students have our, you know, campus app located, they're swiping into the dorms, they're swiping into the dining halls, and they're marking their attendance when they come into class, that some of these systems um, could be advantageous when it comes to keeping track of who is where and things of that sort. But at the same time, I mean, I think any adult who remembers their time in the college dorms, you weren't always proud of every decision you made right. as an 18, like 19, 20 year old. A, yeah, as a teenager, the part of the, the beauty right. and, the, and the danger of being a teenager right. is that you don't take it as seriously. And I think in these shelter at home orders, you see more young people out saying, eh, you know, and now you right. see a bunch of 18 year olds who are away from home for the first time and literally now away from being trapped in their homes, you mm -hmm. know, as some of them would refer it to instead of being <laughs> safer right. at home. Um, right. You know, I, I don't know how, 
how they do that and how the universities, I mean, all it takes is one, one kid who tests positive for COVID-19 in that dorm. And now you've and got a whole other mess on your hands. So or a dining hall or, and, yeah, I mean, and, and I guess the question is how long until they say, here's what we're planning. You know, I know they're doing all these virtual presentations and this is the season for that, but how long till they say, okay, here is our plan for the fall where they can't just kind of put it as plan B, C, D, E, and we'll hit it when we want to, because it's such an un unknown. Right. Well, you know, the one school at this point that has even suggested that they might change their timeline or their delivery of classes is Boston University. And they very specifically, you know, in reading through what they announced, they said, we will be conferring with local health authorities, right? They aren't looking for something at the federal level. You know, there's right. talk at the federal level of we'll be up and running here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think those of us in California are a little skeptical of that given w where things are trending for us. Um, and they're not even saying at the state level, like they're going to very much look at, you know, what do folks in Boston suggest about this, which I imagine Massachusetts gets, you know, included. And we've also seen a number of states now kind of join together and create these regional groups. West and Coast so group and an, an East Coast group and certainly right. I mean, the, the way they affect it, right, is if they're still banning any gathering of, you know, any spot of more than 10, more than 10 people. Well, then right. at Cal, UCLA or any of the UCs or any of the state schools really any college. <laughs> yeah, I think small liberal arts college in Wyoming sounds really nice right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, so is your best advice then to just keep on keeping on doing what you would normally do, be, be realistic about it, but you can't affect what you can't affect? I mean, I guess that's the... Right. I think you have to, you know, I, I think it's important not to bury your head in the sand, you know, yeah. to keep your head up, keep it on a swivel, keep taking information in, you know, not at the point where you're getting, you know, overwhelmed by it. But I think having conversations with, you know, both your counselors at your school, as well as the admissions officers, um, there are certainly trends that are, you know, kind of developing. Um, colleges do, there's a little bit of a group think, I, I bet you by, you know, end of next week, Boston University won't be the only school that is openly talking about this. A number of those behind doors conversations will move external pretty soon. And, is and I think in, really quickly, is that, I mean, you know, I think about a quarter system versus a semester system, quarter system, the 10 week <clears throat> semester is 16, you know, in my, you know, in my thought process of which no one cares about, but <laughs> once that goes through my brain, <laughs> um, right. if you start in January, you go 10 weeks, you take spring break, you go 10 weeks, you can spill into summer at that time frame, go 10 weeks, and the, and the kids still get that full year. Right. Um, they, you could do that with a semester system as well, same, you know, same amount of time. Is Shorten. that the idea or is it the shortened freshman year? I mean, um, well, I think the idea, at least as I understood it, it would be to run the year later. Yeah. Right. Later. And, and so what is the downside of doing that? Because it does give the kids the full experience. I mean, you, you cut into summer session with colleges. But I don't know how I, I really don't know how popular that is in terms of revenue and, and how much money they would make. But what is the downside to doing that and following suit and just giving people a few more months to say, OK, I have I have that time. I, I don't know why more universities that did it they just needed one they needed boston to lead the charge right well uh, you know colleges in general that the, these are instant that you know institutions that are like laden with tradition and history mm -hmm. and you know we the american educational system is set up around an agricultural system from several hundreds years ago i mean very only a small percentage of students are working their family farms these days right but we're still on that cycle i think colleges are a little reticent to kind of shift stuff around because it it is important to recognize that, you know, even something as simple as summer, right? And this is where you have to understand that colleges and universities, these are businesses, right? In our most idealistic world, we think of them as these institutions that are transforming young people and doing research that changes the world, but they still operate, you know, with dollars coming in, mm -hmm. dollars going out. And summer's the dorms are filled with cheerleading camps and yeah. computer programming. I forgot camps about the cheerleading and... camps. 
<laughs> but they're filled with revenue sources, right? Yes. Which are then used to help pay for research or provide, you know, financial aid down the road. So yeah, you can stretch into summer, but then you're nudging out all those, you know, revenue creating opportunities that you have, you know, oh, not yeah. to mention, you know, summer is often where a lot of students work and create money to then, you know, go off and, you know, meet their loan obligations and things of that sort. So there, there's kind of a cascading effect to every decision, it, a little bit of whack-a-mole. You can solve one problem here, but like three others will pop up someplace yeah, else. I guess it's just the question of, you know, is that as big of a problem as the right. entire fall semester or quarter? Yes. And, and, you know. I don't have enough calculators or know how to use them <laughs> to right, figure and, that and out. I, and but, I think for every university, it's different, right? As you were saying, endowments and otherwise and, and projections right. and leadership and how they, you know, and, and general philosophies on how they run education is different. You know, okay, so you, you said, you know, the do's are, you know, do a, you know, a, a, a good look, go to the virtual tours, do the universities, yep. uh, you know, make sure you really think about where you want to go, what you can do and, and what you're willing to do and, and what meets your needs the most. Are there don'ts? You know, I mean, you talk about the people dropping multiple deposits, which is, kind of but you know beyond the financial of not just wanting to do that you, you could end up starting to pay for housing as long as it goes on right like the, the other mm -hmm. deposits are due if they start asking for money for housing it could get expensive right and, and it does jam up the system you're gonna have a lot of people who are on wait lists going don't do that because right you know well, that's not fair to my kid who's waiting to see if he could possibly mm -hmm. or she could possibly get into that school what are your i mean do you recommend that and and what are the other don'ts of of this time period that you would suggest? Well, I, I'm encouraging, you know, college wise, we're encouraging every kid, let yourself fall in love with the school by May 1st, yep. by June 1st. You know, I go back to this idea of accuracy versus precision. Don't get obsessed with like, ah, you know, it's gotta be the perfect school. Oh, how lucky, how exciting that you're gonna get to go to college, mm -hmm. right? Um, at the same time, there are gonna be exceptions to that. You know, if your financial aid um, package hasn't been adjusted and colleges absolutely are willing to listen to appeals. So if you're kind of looking at a school and you're like, ah, oh, we're still a little bit short, reach out to the financial aid office, reach out to the admissions officer you may have been in communication with and find out if there's anything they can do that might help you out. And because if you've already filled out your, your FAFSA, your, your federal aid form, you should, right. they, they have said they, they are able to adjust it because they already have your income. And if things dramatically change, you lose your job. They right. may be able to help out. And, and they'll take supplemental that. information and make, um, make adjustments. Some of them have increased the amount of financial aid. Some schools have a fixed amount of financial aid. So unless there's a student who's asked for a lot of financial aid, says no, then you'll kind of be left hanging. Yeah, and some ask, right? it does not hurt to ask. And at, at this point, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't do it in a cynical way, but if you're kind of doing all the number crunching, you know, parents out there, students, and you're kind of saying, ah, oh, that is my top choice and we're still 5,000 short, reach out, you know, just to know that you are able to close that door firmly and then you can turn your attention um, to other schools. I think the other thing is don't let yourself get bogged down by all these changes that are taking place. There is not a student in California who can control what a school in Boston is doing. You simply don't have that kind of influence or power, they'll make their adjustments. And as they make their adjustments, you have to change your own. That may mean reaching back out to schools that you had previously declined. It may mean saying, you know what, this may be the year I'm going to take a gap year and start fresh and be really productive for this next year. I think that there are plenty of colleges that are going to be, they're trying to communicate as openly as possible. I think high schools are doing a good job, you know, bringing information out to students. So keep you know, listening to the folks who are following this stuff, you know, day to day and, and let them kind of um, guide you. You're, you're definitely not alone in this particular yeah. situation. Well, and I think the benefit is, I, I remember um, hearing a story of a teacher who, a high school teacher now who had graduated during Katrina. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I, you know, he goes, yes, that is the, he wrote an article saying that that is the year you were supposed to be captain of your sports team and you were supposed to ask the girl you had a crush on to the senior ball yeah. and, and all that that gets taken away from you. Um, what I have, you know, told high school seniors, the difference between him is that when he went to college, he was the guy who had been affected by Hurricane Katrina because he had moved to a different state, graduated with strangers. 
these kids are all in it together. There's no yep. way they're going to go where they're that one kid who was in the shelter in place and didn't get right. graduation. Every single person in the class of 2020 is looking, I think, well, not everyone, depending yep. on different parts of the country, but a good majority are going through their virtual graduations or were talking about virtual graduations mm -hmm. and could all start late together. And so that freshman class, you will have that that unique yep. experience that you didn't necessarily plan for and maybe didn't necessarily want, you will have the rest of your brethren to, to celebrate right. it and to celebrate it together. And you may appreciate college way more than you would have before uh, all this happened. Opportunity over obstacle, I 100% agree. Yeah. I think these students who are going through this right now, you mentioned Katrina, even the wildfires in Northern California, yeah. right? That transformed those kids' lives. It transformed those communities colleges figured out how to deal with them. This is on a much greater scale, obviously, but, you know, as, as kind of tradition bound as many of these universities and colleges are, they're also filled with really bright, creative people who care about the world and care about people, and they're going to make the adjustments. And so I think if we kind of keep an optimistic sense here, it can, it can lead to a lot of, a lot of good. And like you said, I, I imagine these kids are going to really go in appreciating college, whether it's what they're learning in the classroom, the parties, the football the parties, games, or whatever it is. Each one, yeah, when they can stand in the stadium yep. and cheer on Ohio State. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> then, <laughs> then uh, you know, they will, they will feel that moment in a deeper way. And they'll have some steel in their spine for sure, which will make them, you know, the generation that will, will change the world for the next pandemic, which unfortunately will probably, you know, Right. We'll need to prepare for and learn, learn from. We've seen a surge in students who want to go to uh, medical school, nursing school, therapy. Um, there's a lot of kids who are looking at what the world needs right now and saying, let and me help, help fill this gap. Help. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an incredible, incredible thing. This class of 2020 that was born in 9-11 right. graduates in this pandemic. I mean, hats off to them because... Wow. I mean, they yeah. don't remember 9-11, but their parents do. And, yeah. And they, they, I mean, even as adults, this feels like, I mean, we're only four months in and I feel like it's 2025. Stop it, right? Someone no, pointed know. out the Super Bowl was like 10 weeks ago and I'm like, no it's way. It's crazy. And I just heard someone having a discussion about had the Niners won and the parade that it would have happened. Maybe would a different world. Coincided. You know, we, look at, oh, we look at everything so so differently. I'm not sure how this happened. I'm not sure how, you know, like right. how Christmas was normal and January was normal. And I was, I was in Miami for the Super Bowl covering it and ah. didn't even, you know, it was, it was a sweet spot that you didn't even know. And it, it is worth noting, Claudine, since you brought that up, I mean, historically we, it, this is a good time. Yes. I encourage students to look to their future, but I think, you know, as they have some downtime here right now with, you know, asynchronous schedules and whatnot. Yeah. Um, it's a good time to look at history too, right? It, it's fascinating to see like what happened to the citizens of this country after the 1918 pandemic, you know, what happened yeah. to them after, you know, the Great Depression and after World War II and the Vietnam War. All these huge disruptions in society have led to some pretty remarkable moments in our society. So it's not just, you know, some hippy dippy blind optimism um it, it's rooted in history and and history does you know better for worse the cliche it repeats itself in some sense that there oh, is yes. probably reason to look forward to a lot i would imagine there will be covid19 pandemic classes that yes. go in the sociology departments the psychology departments the biology and chemistry oh. departments i think there is a lot of higher learning <laughs> yet to be done yep. on this and i think in your industry you are busy this year but next year with those those juniors right now, yes. <laughs> there are going to be a trillion gazillion questions from them about their AP tests, the no SAT, the ACT, the how do you define, do we write a, do we write our college essay on the pandemic and will it be? No. <laughs> yes, you do not. No. <laughs> yes, I, I think that is the, the answer uh, because I, uh, oh wow, what a crazy, crazy world. Yeah, well, Ab I, absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate the insight. I mean, that is such a, it's a great conversation and one we should continue to have as it, as it changes. Definitely. Day. Happy to talk to you, buddy. Arun Panasami from CollegeWise. Thank you so much for the chat. I really appreciate it.
Absolutely. Take care. Stay well.